Good. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Sabina Lim, who is a associate. <laughs> I miss you. That's what, yeah. vice chair of of clinical affairs at the ICANN Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. Now, Sabina is uh, the real deal because uh, the ICANN School of Medicine have just purchased Beth Israel Hospital, Roosevelt Hospital, and St. Luke's. Luke's Hospital in, in New York City. It, it's absolutely the largest healthcare conglomeration, whatever to call it, that I, I know of. And in that purchase, they have uh, bought responsibility for seven to 8,000 methadone patients that are on the various Beth Israel methadone programs. So her job is to try to integrate all of this together, and she's going to talk about some of her experiences. This purchase just started was done in October. in October. It's a very recent. So she's right in the middle of this integrated uh, situation. Um, it works with uh, Wayne Goodman, who's the chair of psychiatry, and Dennis Charney, who's the dean up there. So, to meet it. Thank Thanks. You. Well, thank you and good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to share with you um, our experiences literally at the very, it's really the very beginning stages of this integration process. And I know we'll be talking a lot today and what promises to be a very informative and is already a very informative and very timely discussion about integrated um, healthcare delivery models. And what I'll be talking about is really sort of integration at this really large scale and sharing with you one approach, one way that we're trying to figure out, well, how are we going to create this system of care that serves um, a, a, an enormous um, group of, of people in New York City and beyond? Um, and so I just want to give it one caveat. I am not an addictions expert. I'm a psychiatrist uh, by training, and I actually originally came from Yale, which you know, one of the research bastions for addictions, but it was actually, I was not part of that world. And so I met Dr. Woody because we actually asked him to come um, a couple of months ago to sort of advise us and guide us about um, how we might want to start thinking about integrating all of our services together. So this will be sort of a practical sort of strategic operations kind of overview to go over uh, all the details in the process of how we're starting to integrate our system. So these are some of the overview, uh, the, the overview and the goals of the talk today to understand some of the opportunities and challenges in integrating a very large system, um, that there are some key processes and concepts that apply, I think, in, a, in the integration of a very large system that can still apply when you're trying to create an integrated program, whether it's a collaborative care model or putting in psychiatrists and or addiction specialists within primary care or services, some of the things are, are relatively parallel and actually can are sort of mutually influential. Um, and describe to you one developing model of, of integration. So I'm going to talk about sort of integration as I've already alluded to, sort of this macro and micro level. And I think it's really sort of bi-directional and it influences each other. So if we think about at the, biggest, at the biggest level with the Affordable Care Act, I mean, that's in many ways trying to integrate all of the services, of healthcare services, and not think about services being siloed in one place and sort of putting them all together. Ultimately, that's what everyone is trying to do. Healthcare systems, systems are developing. It's not just hospitals and hospitals coming together, agencies and hospitals, agencies and agencies. Health systems are sometimes coming together. But then there's the more micro level where there's integration efforts and work at departmental levels, at divisional levels, and certainly at developing integrated programs and services. And again, there's, uh, there's a sort of bi-directional, I think, um, uh, relationship that, that, that occurs and is necessary. So just to give a sense of sort of what's happening in terms of these mergers, acquisitions, combinations, there are all sorts of uh, they're slightly different terms. Um, technically, the Mount Sinai and Continuum uh, Health System was uh, technically, uh, the word was used was a combination. Um, but whatever you want to call it, there's been this huge, literally, wave of mergers in the past uh, less than 10 years. And so this is a graphic from the New York Times uh, back in the summer of 2013. And if you look at you know, 2005, there were about 50 or so of these hospital mergers and acquisitions, mostly in the for-profit arena. 
If you look at 2012, it's nearly doubled. Uh, almost every other week, there's some new system, new hospital that's coming together. And just by show of hands, is anyone part of one of these merged or acquired you know, hospital systems or agencies? No, okay. Well, so, <laughs> not, right, that's, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's spreading like wildfire, so to speak. And so there's, um, there's been a number just in the past couple of months that have finalized or um, are in the process of, process of being finalized. So just to give you an example of some of them, and I know Dr. Woody said that this is the, our system at Mount Sinai is large. There are things even larger than we are. So some of the most prominent systems and uh, system mergers and acquisitions as at least per Becker's hospital, uh, hospital review was probably the biggest one is Community Health Systems, which is a Tennessee-based uh, hospital chain. And that acquired Health Management Associates, which is based out of Florida. And that combined system has 206 hospitals. I cannot even imagine how you go about how you go about integrating and organizing that. So I, I do believe that is the largest for-profit hospital chain in, in the country. Um, next up, which is just smaller by just a couple 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 hospitals, is Tenet and Vanguard. I think many people have heard of Tenet and Vanguard. Um, Tenet bought Vanguard, I think, a couple of months ago, and they I think have now a couple, couple hundred hospitals, uh, a little over a hundred hospitals altogether. And actually, Mount Sinai and Continuum. That merger was uh, deemed to be very prominent because this, this uh, combined health system is now the largest private uh, healthcare system in New York City. And this is a city that has many prominent hospitals. It's, Mount Sinai isn't the only game in town. There's New York Presbyterian, there's Sloan Kettering, there's uh, NYU. So um, there is a lot of hubbub ab about this, both you know, locally and nationally. Specific to behavioral health, um, Acadia uh, actually bought some psychiatric hospitals in Seattle and in California. And so there are multi, sort of these multi-state sort of mergers and acquisitions where people are spreading, their footprint is expanding across the country. CRC Health Group, uh, opi I believe it's an opioid uh, treatment center, has bought Habit OPCO. And I think people have heard Hazelden and Betty Ford combined as well. So everyone is coming together. And the, the reasoning behind that is multifold, but it's about building scale. It's no longer just about driving up patient volumes. If you think about just financially, it's not just about driving up patient volumes. It's expanding your scale and scope. And the question is, well, okay, it's great. You've got 206 hospitals. What do you do to, to make that work? But beyond that, there are, at the government agency level, um, sort of what I'm calling sort of mergers or consolidations. So in New York, for example, we have two separate governing agencies, one for mental health called OMH and one for addictions, which is OASIS. They are two separate agencies, but increasingly there's talk that there's going to be some sort of merging of, into, one, into one agency. And I think in Maryland, it's already, it's already one agency. So, at the government level, there are these integration, consolidation, merging activities. And then there are partnerships and affiliations. Everyone wants to be a partner with somebody else or affiliated, um, and that's whether you're actually merged or you've acquired a system, everyone is trying to um, develop these sort of, some sort of relationship with, with um, other, healthcare, uh, other healthcare organizations. So I actually have had two uh, merger acquisition experiences. So prior to Mount Sinai, I actually joined Mount Sinai in March of 2013. I was at Yale for the past for 13 years and for the last year that I was there I oversaw the uh, the integration of the behavioral health service line of Yale New Haven Hospital and it acquired the Hospital of St. Raphael which is a 500 bed community uh, teaching hospital. And I thought that was hard enough. You know, that, <laughs> we went from like 75 beds to like 100 and 135 beds. We went from like to one, to two PHPs and ECT to having six PHP IOPs um, and two ECT services. And that, that, was, that was challenging. It was exciting, but it was challenging at the same time. 
And I knew coming in to Mount Sinai that this merger or combination was going to occur. But as you'll see, it's sort of of a, of a different scale altogether. But at the same time, the kinds of issues and the challenges and the opportunities that, that uh, are present for us, a lot of them were already present uh, at, at, in Connecticut. So it was very helpful for, to have that experience. So just to give you a sense now, so what, what, what is this Mount Sinai health system? So what does it look like right now, basically? So it consists of seven hospitals, actually. It consists not only of Mount Sinai Hospital, which was um, the sort of original uh, of the hospital. It now includes, and everything's been rebranded into Mount Sinai Beth Israel, Beth Israel Brooklyn, Mount Sinai Queens, Mount Sinai Roosevelt, Mount Sinai St. Luke's, and New York Eye and Ear Infirmary of Mount Sinai. So this basically covers, um, uh, most of these are in Manhattan, and a few uh, and in Brooklyn and in Queens. So uh, for New York City, which is a very population dense area, uh, we're basically covering, and you'll see on a map, we're covering sort of the, the whole perimeter of New York, of, of Manhattan. We have 32 departments, over 3,500 inpatient beds, 40, about actually more than 45 ambulatory care practices, 6,600 physicians, to over 2,000 residents and fellows, but we have one medical school. And so this in part, keeping one medical school is one process, one part of the integration process and sort of to begin to standardize and to create a cohesive structure, all the faculty members that used to be affiliated with uh, Albert Einstein or Columbia are now sc I Icon School of Medicine and Mount Sinai faculty members. So this just happened in October, and we're still going through, you know, just again, as I said, the very beginnings of, of this process of integration. So this is a very nice sort of nice website picture of the new, what we call for the psychiatry and addictions component, um, the Mount Sinai Behavioral Health System. And it has a very nice picture of a clinician talking with the patient and all these different uh, sort of disorders that we treat. So, but what's behind that? And what's, what are our services now specific to behavioral health? So we have to actually sort of take this hospital by hospital. So Mount Sinai Hospital in and of itself has over 1,100 beds and it's a tertiary quaternary academic medical center. And specific to the behavioral health services there, we had 102 psychiatry beds with one dual diagnosis unit. We have a dedicated psych ED, we have ECT services, CL services. We had about 44,000 hospital-based ambulatory psych visits in 2013. And we have multiple centers of excellence and a faculty practice focusing on things like mood and anxiety disorders, autism, ADHD, learning disorders, et cetera. So Mount Sinai Hospital is very much an academic medical center, but also very much serving the, the community. It's sort of placed in an unusual uh, area of town where literally two blocks, you know, it's in the Upper East Side. You know, a couple blocks down is one of the wealthiest areas of, of New York, and two blocks up is one of the poorest areas of New York. And so Mount Sinai has always had sort of this interesting mission of being this you know, area that serves some of the, the wealthiest people in the, in the city with also serving the community and some of the poorest and most disenfranchised uh, people in the city. So it's, it's uh, that's sort of, sort of the identity that Sinai had. But I, I would say it was probably more known for this sort of academic medical center. So now, we now have, in addition to that, Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai Roosevelt. So, Prior to the merger, continuum, when I use the word continuum, St. Luke's, Roosevelt, and Beth Israel were actually already a merged system. Many years ago, they had already merged. And at that time, St. Luke's and Roosevelt had been, had, been, had been merged together. It was actually decided that it's going to be two separate entities, two separate hospitals at this time. Um, but combined, what this, this, this is, is a thousand bed community teaching hospital and used to be affiliated with Columbia. There's two hospitals, so St. Luke's is on the upper, upper, upper west side near Columbia University, and one is in Midtown. And they have a very large uh, behavioral health uh, uh, clinical service platform. So 93 inpatient psych beds, 44 inpatient detox and rehab beds, CPAP with mobile crisis, CL, and a very large ambulatory program. We had over 212,000 visits in 2013. A whole gamut of clinic services as well as state contracted services that typically, at least I'm not necessarily used to seeing this in, in a, in a hospital-based 
uh, in a hospital-based setting, basically. And I think some of you may already be familiar with the Addiction Institute of New York, which houses, um, which includes the inpatient detox and rehab beds, plus ambulatory detox, addictions, a straight clinic, a day rehab, and a small MMTP program. And here at, at, uh, at, at St. Luke's and Roosevelt, uh, addictions was under psychiatry. It wasn't under medicine or in a separate group altogether. It was led under psychiatry. And now there's Beth Israel. So Beth Israel is way downtown, and it's a 856 teaching, uh, it's an 856 bed teaching hospital in Lower Manhattan. And again, we have a lot of inpatient psych beds, a lot of inpatient detox and rehab beds, about over 50,000 ambulatory psych visits in 2013, and 1.3 million MMTP visits, um, which was uh, in 2013, which spans about 20 MMTP clinics. Uh, primarily in Manhattan and a couple in Brooklyn. And we also have there an addictions clinic, a, an ambulatory detox, and, and a day rehab program. So to step back, sort of, so what is this all together then? So basically what the behavioral health system includes is now essentially four, an inpatient footprint of over 400 beds, which includes two inpatient dual diagnosis units. Over, and it depends on sort of how you classify some of these clinics, but if you think about licensed, the licensure and things like that, it's over 30 outpatient clinics or co-located programs, two ambulatory detox programs, three addiction day rehabs. I mean, you'll see it. I mean, there's just, a, there's a huge breadth and, and scope to this. And so part of this is a little bit daunting to figure out how we're going to organize and, 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 um, and sort of deliver care in a standardized way. But there's tremendous opportunities here to really transform how we deliver uh, services to the people of, of New York, not just in Manhattan, but throughout the five boroughs. But if that's not enough, we also have a, a behavioral health footprint outside of, quote, psychiatry and addictions. So we have multiple already sort of co-located pseudo-collaborative care services in some, other, in some of the other non-psychiatry, uh, non-addiction services. So we have uh, psychiatrists in primary care settings embedded already. We have them in HIV. Um, and we also have medical services in some of the uh, uh, addictions clinics and in uh, one or two of the MMTP programs. We're also very much involved in the health homes. So there's, a, there's actually two health homes. Mount Sinai is part of one health home, and the uh, continuum, the former continuum, was actually the lead agency of a much larger health home, actually. So we're in the process of integrating and merging that as well. Mount Sinai also has a, has a Medicare ACO. And so, so there's a multiple layers of integration. There's integration activities that we need to figure out within the department within the institution, within the health system, and sort of overall how we're going to uh, work together to really transform the, the care that's being given within the city. But the other important thing for people to be aware of is sort of what was some of the impetus behind this, and you've already heard about what's happening at the national level, but in New York there are some very interesting things that are happening, and so in some ways we're fortunate because sort of stars are sort of a little bit aligning to a certain extent. Um, but there is great excitement because um, sort of, quote, money is coming in, but it's not really a lot of money if you think about it. Um, about a couple of years ago when Andrew Cuomo took over as the governor of New York, he uh, put together what's called a Medicaid redesign team, and he charged this group with transforming the care of, of, of Medicaid recipients in New York and to show that you, can, that you will change outcomes, that you will provide better care to patients and to decrease costs. And that if they could show, or we could show, that we could decrease Medicaid spending by X amount over you know, X amount of years, that the savings given to the feds, that part of it would be able to get, hopefully to get part of the savings back. And actually it started to work. And so in the past few years, they've, they've uh, saved about $17 billion. So this, there's been this long protracted battle between New York and the feds and you know, sort of various sort of comments and letters between Catherine Sebelius and, and, the, and the governor's office. It's all been played out in the papers. But finally, in February, there was basically an agreement in principle that these savings would be returned back in the form of a waiver, basically, and so that this Medicaid waiver is set to pass. And this waiver consists of about 10, about what was originally requested as $10 billion. 
it's coming back as $8 billion in savings. And so $8 billion sounds like a lot, but in reality, it's actually not a lot of money, and it's $8 billion over five years. And there's several streams of funding that this is going to support. And one of the most um, exciting things that people are sort of everyone is, is talking and trying to plan for this is something called DISHRIP. And so is anyone from California by any chance? So DISHRIP, I think there's, a, there's been DISHRIP in California. And so this is similar but not exactly the same as, as the one that's in California, which is it's the Delivery System Reform Incentive Payment Program. And basically what it is is, for New York at least, is developing programs and models, many of which focus on the types of integrated service models that will transform care and that they will give you basically sort of um, lump sum funds to, to be able to operate that, provided that you meet targets. And the number one, the, the singular target for this is to reduce avoidable hospitalizations by 25% in five years. Again, that's, that sounds great. And so, and everyone is, is all sort of, you know, talking with everyone and figuring out what to do. Um, that's a tall order, actually, to reduce 25% of hospitalizations in, in five years. And one of the key things of DISHRIP is, again, in the, in the vein of integrating and making sure that, that breaking down silos is that a key condition is that you have to have community partners. You can't be Mount Sinai and say, I'm going to turn in this fabulous project and we're going to get the money. You need to work with community partners to transform the care that you're providing in your region or your locality or won't even be considered. So that's an inherent requirement for DISHRIP. There's also additional funding for health homes and these 1915I services, which are primarily uh, wraparound, quote, wraparound services for the severe and chronically mentally ill. And the interesting thing is, the other part is, is that Medicaid is going to go from a fee-for-service to a completely managed care model in 2015. And both mental health and addiction services will all be carved in, and so all of the, all of the services and then some that had been funded before, had not been funded before, would all be uh, uh, sort of carved into the Medicaid, to the Medicaid benefits. So, so there's tremendous excitement, but people still don't know exactly the details. And as we all know, the devil is often in the details of how this all plays out, how things are interpreted, and then more so, how do you implement it so you can be successful in, in this kind of an environment? So, so going back to the Sinai integration, so sort of where do you start? So we got this big, big, you know, summer, nice little summary of, you know, what the clinical services are. We've got lots of services serving thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So I said, okay, let's, let's get an inventory. Well, that, that was kind of silly because basically this is what I got. And you can't, <laughs> you know, I'm a list maker and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna see a list. All right, so that didn't work. I mean, it sort of worked, but it, it didn't work. And I'm also a visual person. So I said, okay, well, let's see if we can sort of map it out a little bit and figure out where all the programs are. And let's start with the MMTP program so we can sort of figure out where they are. So this is um, New York City with the, the five boroughs. And so this is Mount Sinai. This is St. Luke's. This is Roosevelt. And this is Beth Israel. So you can see it sort of covers the whole perimeter of Manhattan. And, um, at first, it was, everyone was very excited, but then they realized the challenges of just commuting <laughs> between. <laughs> I mean, you have to build in an hour almost a day, and if you're traveling two to three times per day, and those are the kinds of things I think when you're integrating you know, groups together, you sort of, those are the kinds of things that are like, oh, we've got all this to do, but another hour is taken out of your day just in commuting alone, right, on top of additional commutes. So like, okay, but this is good. Then like, okay, where are some of the MMTP programs? All right, there's one here, there's one here, and 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 it's just, like, okay, this isn't gonna work either, basically. <laughs> At the same time, it was a good exercise in sort of bringing people together and talking with each other, because what I've learned, at least what I think is, 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 is a key factor in any integration process is at the end of the day, it's the people and the processes. And in order for it to, in order for any integration, you can have the structure, you can have brands, you can have names, but if the people and the processes don't work together and are fine-tuned and streamlined, um, you have a name. You don't, you don't have a real integrated system. So, oh, there's one more star. Okay. So, 
you developed a work plan, basically. And so this is the, the, the approach that I'd used in, um, at Yale, and to some degree, um, you, it, we're using it, very, it's a very similar sort of model that's, that we're rolling out for Sinai. And you know, we'll see if it works. This is a work in progress, and we're learning as we're going. But these are some of the, the high points of this work plan. So number one, defining our values, principles, and goals. Okay. My goodness, already? 10 minutes? Okay, I gotta go really fast, okay. Defining process goals, defining leadership structure, defining operational work plans and ways to monitor progress. And so the main thing is, is that we need to integrate at a system level to promote integration at a program level, that there's, this process is bi-directional and iterative, and to remove silos at every opportunity. There's tremendous silos between psychiatry and addictions. I mean, it's just, I, I'm, a, I'm a psychiatrist, and I can say that when I had someone, when I was an attending psychiatrist on an inpatient unit, I did not feel comfortable treating someone with an, with an addictions disorder. Like, oh, let me find someone else to do that. I know that, I know I'm not the only one. So even at a person level, and certainly at a programmatic and system level, um, we did that. And so everything that we're doing is trying to break down from the very beginning um, those silos. So here are our goals and principles. So we have, you know, these are all nice goals and principles, but what, what do these sort of mean? But key thing to note from the very beginning that we're gonna integrate, have an integrated model of collaborative medical and behavioral health services. Key things, we're gonna to try to avoid, it's done this way here. Just, what, just because it's done at Mount Sinai doesn't mean that it's the best way. We can learn from all of each other. And so whether we're talking about primary care and addictions, primary care and mental health, quote unquote, being it's done this way here doesn't all, always work. Always thinking about how you can do something versus why it can't be done. It's very easy to figure out when you have all these rules and regulations why you can't do something. But first and foremost, try to figure out a way how you can get it done. Collaborate assertively at every level. And at the end of the day, we expect a lot out of our patients. We expect them to go to a primary care doctor here, and then to your psychiatrist here, and to a case manager here. It's very hard. I mean, I can't even remember to go to set up an appointment for my doctor, for God's sake, many times. In order, I think in order for a patient's behaviors, quote unquote, to change, we have to rethink in the way the system is behaving, basically. And so these are, I'm gonna skip over some of these slides. But the other key thing is we identify process goals. You can have all these lofty goals, but if you don't have intermediate steps to figure out how you're gonna get there, you need to think, you need to make sure that you have a clear work plan for it. The other clear, the other important part is leadership. So one of the key things that we did was we set up a steering committee and that we set up system clinical chiefs. So these clinical chiefs are responsible for the clinical programming throughout all of the campuses that have um, behavioral health services there. And we have a single leader for addictions uh, system wide. And this, I think some of you may already know him, Rick Rosenthal, he is the, the director for the addictions, uh, for the addictions uh, programs. And he, is in it, and he is part of the steering committee. And we also have multiple subcommittees. And I'll just give you an example of sort of what we've been doing in these subcommittees to try to, at least within psychiatry and addictions, to avoid, well, this is the way it should be done for addictions versus this is the way it should be done in psychiatry. So we have an inpatient clinical pathways and outcomes subcommittee. It's a way to sort of transform and standardize inpatient care. We don't have two separate groups working on the inpatient. We have the, the inpatient psychiatrists who would traditionally work in the inpatient psych units, and we have the addictions uh, psychologists and psychiatrists, and they're all together. And there may be slightly different processes, different rules for things, but the basic concepts of creating standardized screening tools creating standardized algorithms to diminish variance as much as possible, to figure out group therapy, for example. Let's use the expertise that we have in, in, in addictions within our own department, and let's create a really good uh, group therapy component for, uh, substance, for substance use in the inpatient psych unit. There's no, it's, they don't live apart. <laughs> they, they're in the same person many times. So the other big part is breaking down silos outside of your own department. Um, as much as we can develop all of the clinical work together, there are outside constraints, and the biggest ones are often finance and IT. And one of the things that we are doing is working and just pushing and pushing and pushing and working with our finance colleagues 
breaking down the silos and making sure that they're working with us. And so we meet with them every week. It took, it took a top-down approach, leadership had to agree to this, but that we need to work together because all these changes have significant impact and are impacted by um, the finances and the whole reimbursement process. The other part, the part is, okay, so you can have all these goals and you can have process goals and you can have nice subcommittees. Well, how are you gonna keep track of all of this? How are you gonna know that what you're doing is right? So part of, part of this whole thing is you gotta be accountable. And so this is one way that we're using to try to make sure that we stay accountable. And it's just, it's just a simple dashboard. And as I said, I'm very visual, so I, and I like colors. So we have, and I think many of you may be familiar with this, just using a dashboard. Are we on track? Are we meeting our goals, basically? And we have our high-level goals and our process goals that we make sure, and we go over this every two weeks, and we make sure that we're sort of on track and identify problems and obstacles as we go along. And really briefly, and I know you'll be hearing more about this the whole rest of the day, if we talk more now about specific integrated programs. So what is integrated care? So this is sort of a humorous and somewhat simply simple slide, but basically one way to think about integrated care is you have your head and the body and integrated care is the neck. But again, you can't just suture on the neck. You gotta create the, the nerves, the blood vessels. Again, it's all the processes and all the communication and the pathways that are, that are there that you need to build together, basically. And integration is great, but you need a team and you need a process to keep each other accountable and a process for working together. You're gonna hear a lot about this already. The key thing is you hear a lot about co-location. Co-location is not the same as integration. And this is a SAMHSA slide that sort of describes the sort of the spectrum or the continuum of collaborative care. And so you have at the left, the, some of what we already do in basic medicine and then to the most developed where there's a fundamental practice change. And it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see that part of this is sort of the location, but if you look down below, it's not just the location. It's how integrated are your teams? Are you just calling a psychiatrist when someone you think has a, has a, has a, a mental health or a substance use diagnosis? Or are you regularly reviewing together all your patients and thinking about together are, are, you, um, are, you, uh, work, are, are you identifying and um, setting appropriate treatment plans for them as a team. So just quickly go over some, um, at a, sort of this more micro level, some of the integrated models that we've already developed or in the process of rolling out. So this is, um, uh, I'll just sort of quickly oh, go through this. So this is, we are, we're creating sort of this robust uh, mental health clinic within our primary care associates. And so this was just sort of to point out some of, with all the great talk about, you know, integrate collaborative care is like the big buzzword, but there are so many elements to make this work. And some of the key things are data. We often hear, we get asked all the time, we need mental health services, we need a psychiatrist. And then when we asked for data, it just wasn't the volumes that we thought that they sort of qualitatively felt. It's not to diminish the need, it was just very hard to provide additional resources when the data did not, quote, necessarily support that. Space. This is probably like the biggest sort of obstacle. It took us two months just to go through how to figure out where to locate people and how to find space without requiring capital renovation costs, because that would have been a deal breaker, essentially. And all of these other things, and the other the last thing I just want to point out is the reimbursement. Again, you can have a great model and, it's, and it sounds clinically wonderful, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, you need to make sure that you get paid for doing this. And it's down to literally making sure you have the right process from the encounter to how it gets allocated on a P&L, basically. Is psychiatry or addictions gonna you know, bear the expense, but none of the revenues are gonna be associated with that. Now again, in a hospital system, it gets exceedingly complicated, um, so that's always on our minds. But you know, down to every last detail, you wanna sort of think about that. The other integration model that we're talking about is, and in the process of developing, is integration within psych settings. Again, instead of having a separate clinic that's located here, separate day treatment that's over here, addictions clinic that's over here, it's again not thinking about psych and addictions. It's about everything is, is gonna be together wherever possible so that we have an integrated outpatient program where we have on one floor, and, and again, we got very lucky here, a clinic, a day treatment program, a new PHP, primary care services, 
and what we're calling and developing core addiction services, that no matter where people are, that we are going to train and we are going to develop some core addiction services based on some basic screening, screening and assessment tools, and being able to improve the access to and the identification of substance use disorders wherever they are, whether they're in medicine or in psychiatry or in, a, in, in, in the ED. And so this is just one, one last model where we actually combined physically uh, the mental health clinics and the addictions clinic into one setting. And so one of the best things about this is that there's a single comprehensive assessment center. And this center does the intakes for all these ambulatory psych programs. We're already doing that for the addictions programs. We're enhancing that. We're developing new and then more uh, robust screening tools. We have a centralized reg area, easy referral between programs, and to make sure that there's greater clinical programmatic integration between the two, the two sets of programs. It's the same leadership, the same people. They all have to work together fluidly as a team. And of course, this will take some time to make this work, but you know, that these are sort of, the, sort of the models that we're developing. And these are just some, some of the things. There are sort of widespread and much more big league sort of plans for transforming how we deliver care in the inpatient setting, thinking about how we identify and screen for patients, not just with mental health, quote, mental health disorders, but addictive disorders, substance abuse disorders in the inpatient setting and developing a proactive behavioral health team that will go and identify people early on and connect them to treatment as soon as possible. So a lot of this is about bringing services to patients where there are, meeting them at least halfway, and instead of waiting for them to come to us to sort of tailor our programs more towards that, more towards them in that sense, and to break down the cultural silos um, and the structural silos that, that, that have constantly been there. And at the end of the day, we're setting the bar very high. If you don't set the bar high, if you set the bar here, you're only gonna get here. And we have tremendous ambitions and a tremendous scope, but we need to be able to reach for the skies to a certain extent. Um, and at the same time, make sure that we go through all of the details to make these, all of these goals and all these mandates that are set out before us to really be able to operationalize and implement them. So, that's the end. I'm sorry for the hurried, for the hurried uh, talk, but I'll take any questions if you have any.